Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the fourth annual Alice P. Lynn Memorial Lecture. My name is Melissa Begg, and I have the great honor of being the Dean of the Columbia School of Social Work. The Alice P. Lynn Memorial Lecture gives us an opportunity to hear from leaders in public policy and administration. It's a wonderful opportunity for our community to engage with ideas that are shaping the future of social welfare. And I'm sure that the conversations that start here will resonate far beyond this event. The Lynn Lecture and the Lynn Doctoral Scholarship were both created by Dr. Nan Lynn to honor the memory of Alice, his wife of 48 years. Dr. Alice P. Lynn was born in Chengdu, China and raised in Taiwan. She immigrated to the United States in 1964, receiving her master's in social work from the University of Michigan, where in her own words, she was stimulated and challenged to think beyond her immediate concerns. She earned her doctorate from the Columbia School of Social Work in 1985. After completing her doctorate, Dr. Alice Lynn enjoyed an illustrious and impactful career in social welfare administration. She served as deputy commissioner for the New York State Office of Mental Health, as a professor at Duke University Fuqua School of Business, and as a consultant to local governments across the country. She was a proud Columbia alum, and her service to the school includes eight years as president of our Dean's Advisory Board. I'm delighted this evening to welcome Dr. Lynn's husband, Dr. Nan Lynn, and members of the Lynn family who are joining us. Dr. Lynn, I'd like to extend our community's warm regards and heartfelt thanks to you. Your generosity enables us to hear from outstanding speakers like Dr. William Elliott. I can't wait to hear more about his important work on building assets for children as a means of leveling the playing field and restoring education as society's great equalizer. So let's move forward. I'd now like to introduce my wonderful colleague, Dr. Ronald Mincy. Dr. Mincy is the Maurice V. Russell Professor of Social Policy and Social Work Practice here at CSSW. He's also the director of the Center for Research on Fathers, Children, and Family Wellbeing, co-principal investigator of the Fragile Families and Child Wellbeing Study, and a member of the Columbia Population Research Center. Renowned for his groundbreaking conceptualizations and perspectives on some of our nation's most challenging social concerns, Professor Mincy created, conceptualized, and advanced the development of research on fragile families, that is disadvantaged families with low-income fathers. He's been a leader in calling attention to the blight of young black men and other vulnerable populations. He's the author of numerous articles and book chapters and editor of the book, Black Males Left Behind. Over the course of his career, Dr. Mincy has served on leading advisory boards and councils, including the National Poverty Center at the University of Michigan and the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. He's been widely recognized for his influence on social policy. And earlier this year, uh, we were delighted when the Society for Social Work and Research presented him with the Social Policy Researcher Award, honoring distinguished researchers who've made outstanding contributions to social policy at the local, national, and international levels. Dr. Mincy, it's a pleasure to turn it over to you. Thank you so much for that generous introduction. But uh, my task today is to focus our attention on uh, Dr. Uh, William Elliott III. Uh, Professor Elliott is a leading researcher uh, in fields of college savings accounts, college debt and wealth inequality. Uh, he's uh, shaped uh, by his own personal experiences, which I hope he'll have a little time to share. Uh, in addition, he has uh, influenced uh, the development of child uh, savings accounts uh, in states throughout the country, uh, uh, in cities uh, in Oakland, uh, the, the promise uh, of effort in California, uh, in New Mexico, in San Francisco, and uh, has really done some, uh, I think, high level thinking in this area, as well as uh, developing the hard evidence uh, to support uh, the vision for changing the way we think about uh, wealth distributions and higher education. Uh, welcome, Dr. Elliott. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's been um interesting in, in, in a vibrant day already. I've had a chance to speak to uh, a number of uh, faculty uh, at Columbia, and, and I, and I want to say that it's been a, a good experience and uh, intellectual experience helping me think things. And I, I and one of the things I hope from, from this talk is, is that um, I should share the screen. Um, sorry, one second. No, uh, I want to make sure I share the screen before I get lost. Is is that I hope that not only will you hear a talk, uh, but that you will uh, some of you, not all of you, but some of you will take action on the talk. Like it will inspire you to go into your local community, 
uh, and, and, and make an impact and make a difference. And, and I can say that, and, and it would change some of your thinking about some things. Uh, to me, that, that would be a success and, and really honor uh, Alice Lynn in the way that uh, she should be honored. Um, I'm really thankful for this opportunity uh, to speak to you all. So I'm advancing slides now. So we're, we're gonna jump into the talks. So Alice Lynn wrote, the very survival and growth of humankind depends on how the races and nations live and work together and how men and women learn to share the same dreams. What Dr. Lynn referred to as dreams, academics sometimes call aspirations. And what I will talk to you today about is as hope. I think these words uh, are so fitting for the discussion that I will uh, try to have with you today when we try to distinguish between aspirational hopes and what I would refer to as tangible hope. So the first thing we'll try to do is try to give you some background and vision about uh, what, how America kind of thinks about hope as, as I see it. And one way is, is how to define prosperity in America. And, and to me, this, this uh, statement from uh, President Roosevelt, uh, has, and I just read it maybe uh, a year ago, has really shaped my thinking in a lot of ways. And he says, liberty requires opportunity to make a living decent according to the standard of the time. A living that gives man not only enough to live by, but something to live for. Without this opportunity, he continued, life was no longer free, liberty no longer rural, men could no longer follow the pursuit of happiness. I'm gonna repeat uh, a section of that and, and think about it for a second. Liberty requires opportunity to make a living decent according to the standard of the time, a living that gives man not only enough to live by. And, and I think much of our social policy and, and, and maybe many places across the world stop there with just having enough to live by. And, and really that is not the American hope or dream is that I can, as an individual, have enough money to pay my bills today, that I could eat today and, and have no prospects for tomorrow. That, that is not what the American dream looks like, but something to live for, right? People. And what has made America great is, is having that sense that you have something to live for. That goes beyond just eating the day or making it through the day, but whether or not you can have a hope, not only for yourself, but for your kids for the future. So an ideal everyone, so the ideal is that everyone's included. President Bill Clinton voiced both the spirit of the American dream and the socialization into it, when he said, the American dream that we all is all raised on is a simple but powerful one. If you work hard and play by the rules, you should be given a chance to go as far as your God-given ability will take you. This idea that effort and ability distinguishes those that have and don't is ingrained in American society. Now, we understand that that doesn't always play out that way, but that's the ideal that through effort, through one's ability, you should be able to change your circumstances. Now that's built on to some degree, the idea in the early days of America that we had a rich land that was surrounded by water that protected us. And so these hopes, they weren't just hopes, but seemed tangible and achievable because of the richness of our nation. Uh, I think now it's more built on not so much the natural minerals that we possess or our borders, which can be easily approached by planes and in, in boats, but by the institutions that we have, the constitution, the, this, the educational institutions, the financial institutions, these are belief and faith in these institutions that they'll be there for us, that they'll, um, that we can trust in them, gives us that sense that if we only work hard, the right institutions are available, the right resources are available, and that it really is about our effort and ability. Now, like I said, uh, we know that doesn't work out in everybody's life the same, but that's the ideal. Education is a key tool for turning effort and ability into prosperity. It's not the only path, but it's been a critical path uh, in American history 
in at least one we tout as a critical path. Education is a path to the American dream. While European nations have uh, relied on the direct redistributive role of the welfare state to reconcile citizenship in markets, the United States has chosen to use education as a lever for ensuring equitable outcomes. And so education has for many years played a central role in establishing and helping us uh, have faith that it is not where you're born, but through your own effort and ability applied in school, through education that you can progress and change your lot in life. Again, not the only path, but a really, really important path. And so we've set up this vision of hope that it's more than just having enough to make it through the day, but actually having something to live for. And we said that we have these institutions that allow us through our own effort and ability to achieve this better life. And it's, and it's had some tangibleness or realness to us because of our belief in our institutions. I wanna make a, a, a distinction between aspirational hope and, 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 and its function. According to Reynolds and Pimbleton, Aspirations are the goals a person wishes, or maybe more appropriate, dreams to achieve. Most Americans still hold this dream. A recent poll finds that 54% of Americans aspire for their children to attend a four-year college after leaving high school. Most of us buy into this, this dream or hope that education is a path uh, towards prosperity. Interestingly enough, uh, we're talking about aspirations. Black parents are more likely to aspire for their children to attend a four-year college, 67%, than Hispanics, 56%, or white parents. So minorities actually buy into this dream uh, more so uh, than other people. The belief in the power of education to level the playing field provides Americans with a rationale for why some fail, a justification, if you will, for continuing to believe in the American way of life, despite some being left behind. In this way, taking a phrase from Marx, it might be said that education functions as a type of opium, opium in America, kind of this thing that allows us to continue to persist in the face of great difficulties. Um, holding this dream is important and it serves a function in our society, even if it doesn't align up with our um, realities in our life, that we still hold this fundamental belief in the American system and education being a path. And one of the reasons we, we maintain our belief in this American system is because we believe that education provides us with a path towards prosperity uh, through the use of our effort and ability. Aspirational hopes are uh, important, but can be detached from reality. We have two Americas, unfortunately, uh, the haves and the have-nots, uh, wealth and equality in America. Well, this is, is a quick, uh, we can get into much more detail about uh, kind of the disparity in America, but in, in most of you are, are familiar with kind of the expansiveness of wealth and equality. So this is a quick snapshot. Wealth and equality has increased continuously since 1978, such that by 2012, the share owned by the top 0.1%, 1% was three times higher uh, than in the late 1980s. So wealth and quality uh, continues to grow uh, and very few people uh, possess most of the wealth in America. Families of color are disproportionately overrepresented among those in the lower rungs of the wealth distribution, which is not shocking to anybody. In 2013, the average wealth of white families was 500,000 higher than the average wealth of black and Latino families. In other words, white families had on average seven times the wealth of black families and six times the wealth of Latino families. So we're talking about large disparities. Crucially, however, the racial wealth gap persists even among families at the same income levels and increases in income do not result in equal wealth gains for everyone. So it's not tied, wealth is not directly linked to income. This is primarily because families of colors have limited access to wealth building structures. For example, the third quarter of 2016, the home ownership rate for households, and, and most people in America contain most of their wealth in their house, 
uh, households headed up by non-Hispanic whites have 71.9% compared to 41.3% for black households and 47% uh, for households identified as Hispanic or Latino. Simple point, there's a lot of wealth inequality in America uh, and really throughout the world, but, but, but particularly in America. The dream of education has an equalizer. Educational aspirations play an important role in helping maintain belief in the American dream. However, they may do little to change behavior uh, when they do not line up with children's lived experiences. One reason I'm, I'm belaboring this idea that these aspirations uh, play a critical role in America in maintaining our system is because there is um, an ongoing conversation in America right now of whether or not the American dream still exists for most people, whether it is of any relevance or importance. And, and that comes from all sides of the political spe spectrum. And, and I think it's important to emphasize that, that it continues to play an important role in America in that without an adequate replacement for education as a path to equality or um, an adequate replacement for the American dream, we're likely to see things really break down in society. Um, it, it really plays a, a vital role. However, education is, as equalizers, detached from low-income minority children's experiences, increasingly. It's not just about equal access, but also equal returns. Children from, and when I say it's not just about equal access, I mean education. It's not just about providing kids access to education, but once they get a degree, complete a degree, it's important that they receive similar returns. Children from lower wealth families are less likely to attend and complete college than their counterparts. So uh, they don't even get to college and then they, they don't complete as often. Poor children earn less from the degree. Bachelor degree holders from low income families start their careers earning about one third less than those from higher income families. Uh, minority children earn less for the degree. Every stat you can possibly pull out, it seems, uh, is always worse for minority families. Hispanic and Black American students with a degree have less income and net worth than their white and Asian counterparts. Uh, and the degrees don't protect uh, equally. So once you have a degree, it doesn't give you the same protection. During the Great Recession, Black and Hispanic college grad families experienced wealth declines for greater than, far greater than white families without a college degree. And so they earn less, they have less wealth, and their wealth is less protected. It's, it's, it's not a uh, good situation. So not all education paths are equal, uh, college debt versus assets. I wanted to read to you a little bit of my life story, juxtapose it to uh, a colleague of mine to kind of paint this picture for you. Uh, I'm a 51 year old black male who dropped out of high school. And though I can now see the proverbial light at the end of the tunnel, I have not yet achieved true financial well-being for me and my family. As a, as a result of growing up in poverty, not only did I enter college behind academically, but my family had few financial resources to help pay for college. Consequently, I relied heavily on student loans, the only way I could see to continue my education. I ended up graduating with a bachelor degree and $40,000 in debt. After paying off these loans in, a mil in the military, I went to graduate school and left with a PhD and $100,000 in debt. My story represents the story of many poor children in America under our current financial aid system. Let me tell you a different story, much rarer, but aligns, with, aligns better with the ideal of education being a path to the American dream. As Myrna Lewis grew, her grandparents' financial contributions facilitated her educational attainment, both directly and indirectly. What was a source of financial security for her parents became the foundation of economic mobility for her. Melinda and her husband started building a uh, home equity before they turned 25, had access to retirement savings through their employers, and had no outstanding student debt with which to contend. As a result, they were well positioned for a head start on college saving and are on track to have their four kids' education paid for before they finish high school. Melinda Lewis' story, The Asset Empowered Path to the American Dream. It is a path that requires lots of hard work, 
but it's an ease because of wealth transfers at critical stages along the way, whether it is for college, buying a vehicle, a home, retirement, or saving for kids' education. This path also carries different expectations of future educational attainment, cultivates different capacities that equip children to achieve and promise a payoff more consistent with what we think of as success. For most Americans, though, it's a block path. Without saving or an infusion of wealth, the American dream is merely a, a mirage, not for you, but someone else. Hopefully it gives you somewhat of a, a, a vision of the two different kinds of paths that people face, which has a, an effect on the return that people have from their degrees. Student debt's role in detaching the dream from reality. Uh, Post-college financial health, and this is really a relatively new area of, of research and studies, along with um, the, the research on the return on a degree uh, is, is relatively new, particularly looking at it from the lens of um, education not being equitable. So what we find is, and I say we researchers in general, uh, find that labor market decisions are influenced by college debt. The, low-income families are much less likely to take a job that, for example, doesn't pay as well, uh, but has a lot of uh, advantages for them for the long-term career. And so they end up earning less over time. Delay in marriage, they marry later. Uh, they earn less uh, by the time they reach their 40s. They have less net worth. They, their retirement savings, they, they put off retirement savings and start saving later. Uh, they, they put off buying a home and they buy homes in, in neighborhoods that don't have, present as much value. Uh, they put off starting a business, buying rentals um, and all these types of things. According to the government accounting office, assuming a standard 10 year payback at 7% annual interest, average cumulative undergraduate educational debt exceeded 18,000 and 2,000, which corresponds to a $6,000 premium borrowers pay for a college education the hidden cost of being an indebted college graduate. Elliot, and that's probably uh, undersized. Elliot and Rosh are a major mobility as the likelihood and rate of achieving median household net worth among four-year college graduates were above who were at least age 22. After controlling for key differences, they found that acquiring a relatively small amount of $10,000 in student loans is associated with a 16% decrease in the uh, rate of achieving median net worth, which basically means there's a, a, a failure to launch, that once they um, graduate from college, it takes them far longer to end up uh, meeting median net worth in America. Uh, and it's interesting, and I'm looking at this research here, but there's other research from the Federal Reserve Bank in, in, in uh, New York that shows that it's not even large amounts of dollars. In the news media, we often talk about the $100,000 people like myself who went on for a PhD as examples, but really small amounts of debt, 10,000 or less, can have an impact on one's ability to climb the economic ladder. Parental investments also influence the return degree. Shapiro and colleagues find that a $1 increase in income later translates to a $5 increase in wealth for whites, but only a 70 cent increase for blacks. Importantly, they also uh, found that when blacks start off with similar levels of assets, uh, they have a return of uh, $4.03 for each dollar increase in income, less than a $5 increase um, whites realize. This suggests quite simply that in order to build assets on average, you have to start with assets. You always hear the saying, assets beget assets, shouldn't be shocking to us. Something as we all know intuitively in that blacks might need slightly more. What I mean by that is, is when we see, even when they start off with equal amounts of wealth, they don't quite reach the same level of return on income as, as whites do. And that speaks to the fact that even if we create the programs I'll talk about later, uh, it doesn't totally account for some of the racial issues that exist within our society, uh, but it goes a long way. Children of wealth parents start off with an advantage because their parents are able to invest more in them in their education. High income parents increased their spending on enrichment by 151% between 1972 and 2006. 
while low-income parents, in an effort to keep up, could only increase their investments by 57%, which also, once again, reflects the value we see as Americans in education as a path, uh, but we can invest in it un unevenly because of our um, starting points. Early parental educational investments in their children has been shown to turn into higher income and greater net worth in adulthood. So these early investments not only impact educational outcomes, they also impact that return on a degree in the long run. Parental support does not stop when they go to college. Support continues into early adulthood, strengthening the return on a degree for wealthy kids. And so we're gonna talk about it a little bit more later, but this provides us some glimpse potentially of an intervention or a way of addressing wealth inequality, early parental investments. Tweaks not enough. In the structures of scientific revolutions, Thomas Kuhn discusses how periods of normal science are interrupted by periods of revolutionary science. Kuhn suggests that during periods of normal science, researchers identify questions to investigate based on existing knowledge. To me, that's such a profound statement because he's saying that like our minds are restricted in what we can even see as possible based upon our current circumstances. <clears throat> the insights gained from these analyses are constrained then by the limits of the prevailing paradigm. Resulting changes tend to mostly comprise tweaks around the margins rather than fundamental reconsiderations. Periods of normal science persist until the current is no longer able to solve a growing number of the problems or when external per events provoke a clamor for a different vision, a revolution. I, I, I was one of my talks today with one of the uh, uh, faculty here at Columbia. I mentioned that when I was um, first starting kind of study student debt, I went to the, uh, to the uh, finance, uh, Federal Reserve Bank in, in St. Louis, and I gave a talk on uh, the survey consumer finance. I did a, a research study looking at survey consumer finance, looking at how uh, people who graduate when compared to people who graduate with debt and people who graduate without debt, those with debt have less uh, wealth um, later in life. And so uh, it was interesting uh, because there were people there who were from the Federal Reserve Bank in Washington, D.C., and, and they helped construct the consumer and consumer finance. And they said, well, we looked at uh, this data on college debt and we didn't find these findings. And so, and I was, I was, it was kind of funny, I was mentioning to them that I was, you know, young, not in age, but in my experience uh, in talking to economists and, and being in such an environment, such a confrontational environment. And so I didn't respond well to the questions, had nothing really to say, didn't feel like I was in a position to say much. And they asked me for my data, my syntax, and they re-ran an analysis. And, and they found out that it did check out. And, and, and the problem was, is what Coons talks about here. The insights gained from these analyses are constrained then by the limits of the prevailing paradigm. And what that meant was, is that they didn't never ask the question of the data. They never looked at whether or not, they never compared college graduates with debt to college graduates without debt. And so our current paradigms, way of thinking about the world, sometimes limit what we know and can know. And, and that's really important to understand. And then the second part of this is, is that the system fights to maintain the system. And, and, and oftentimes we as researchers uh, participate in helping maintain that system. And so we create what I call tweaks around the margins or what Kuhn calls tweaks around the margins. I'm not going to go over all this information on this slide, but I wanted to mention some of it. Treating the symptoms, not the underlying problem, deferment and forbearance, income-based repayment, paid forward, income sharing agreements. These are all what I would call tweaks around the margins. How do we maintain our current financial aid system that focuses on using debt to pay for college? We do it by creating these tweaks, which reduce bad things like people uh, uh, defaulting on their loans, which gain a lot of media. Nine years after leaving uh, school, the 2005 cohort has paid down only 38% of its original student debt. Under a standard 10-year amortization schedule, these loans would be approaching full repayment and only about 10% of the original balance would remain. Uh, 
four years after earning a bachelor's degree, Black graduates in the 2008 cohort held $24,720 more student loan debt than white graduates, $52,726 versus $28,000. It was less than $2,000 in 1993. So this debt increases, continues to increase. And as they have loans, it actually grows. So they have loans for long periods of time. They're not paying it down, largely because the interest rates and stuff is so high uh, on those loans that it grows over time. Uh, I'm gonna mention just the uh, last part. The average time uh, that it takes to repay student loans grew from about seven years in 1992 to a little more than 13 years in 2010. And, and the point of that is, is that um, a lot of these tweaks around the margins actually find ways to farther extend the time to repaying back student loans, which sounds good, would it give you more time to pay it, pay it back? What that really means for a lot of uh, uh, families is that that's more time that they don't feel like they're in a position to invest in assets. So they don't invest in their retirement accounts because they're in debt. They delay starting a family because they're in debt. And so creating these programs that only extend the time period, only farther and reduce the time that families have to build assets or feel like they can build assets. And that's a major problem. Uh, free college better than debt uh, dependency, but also not enough. The unequal return on a degree suggests that strategies that focus only on college affordability, even free college, will fail to achieve some of our most cherished aspirations uh, for education to fulfill its role as an uh, anti-poverty strategy equalizer. It also means that where you start off in life matters and whether or not you have assets growing up matters for the types of outcomes you will be able to achieve and for whether education pays off equally for all. When it comes to investing in higher education as a path to the American dream of equitable opportunity for all then, free without asset building will fail to reduce inequality from my estimation and, and from another of other uh, studies. The next revolution should be an asset revolution. While government investments to mimic early transfers, this is referring back to our conversation about parental investments. While government investments to mimic early transfers from wealthy parents to their children might reduce wealth inequality, it is not at all clear that simply providing children with a free education will do the same. If it does not reduce wealth inequality, it is not the revolution we are looking for within the education system and the opportunity structure in America. The revolution requires a transfer of assets from the rich to the poor to level the playing field and restore the American dream where effort and ability are to determine one's outcomes, not the financial situation you are born into. One of the reasons I mention this is because as I talk to people today, I've constantly mentioned that I, I think we, we, we have a narrative challenge and in that unfortunately many low income uh, white families have been made to believe that wealth inequality is a black issue and a black issue based on a lack of effort and ability. But really it's an American issue and it's an issue in which if we increase the wealth of low income families, we actually strengthen the ability of effort and ability to be the determining outcome for why one person succeeds and another doesn't succeed. Like you need a certain level of wealth, of assets to really use your effort and ability in education or otherwise to uh, build and achieve the American dream. And that's lost, lost on many of us. So assets link futures to the present, making hope feel tangible. This idea of tangible and maybe I like it because it seems we can talk about educational expectations or college bound identities and different things, but I like the idea of tangible home because it's very practical. It's a very simple, simple uh, idea. I'm going to go back once more time to President Roosevelt's words just to put them in your mind once again. Liberty requires opportunity to make a living, a living decent according to the standard of the time. There's a standard during that period of time, a living that gives man not only enough to live by, 
can I eat today? But something to live for. Do I have a future? Do my kids have a future? So families need not only income to consume enough to survive, but also wealth to have something to live for. Wealth gives you something to live for. You don't hope for things you already have. You hope for things you do not yet have, right? It makes no sense logically to hope for the money you already have in your pocket, the house you already own. You, you hope for things that you don't yet have, something in the future. Making hope tangible has to do with making something far off feel close, requiring action now. One way to make something far off feel close is to make strong links between the present and the future. Wealth allows people to plan for future consumption, a strong link, I argue, between the present and the future. In this way, people can see their future selves going to college or retiring, for example. Knowing what you can consume in the future makes it feel close, tangible, real, something you can act on now with less risk. I was talking to another uh, uh, faculty member at Columbia, and, and she mentioned it was like blew my mind because I had a similar experience. She mentioned how she grew up in poverty and that. Um, when she was in the PhD program, she felt herself rushing through the program in fear that something tragic would happen, something would derail her, and she wouldn't be able to complete. Um, this is kind of why the future for low-income people feels so squishy, if you will. I, I, I always tell the story about when I was in a PhD program. I graduated from WashU in three years which I was the second person to do it in such a short period of time. And the reason why I did it was because I was the same reasons. I always felt like, my not just felt like, my experience in life was something always derailed. I was in, in law school before I went to school for social work. And my family got evicted from their house. I had to you know, drop out of college, went into the military, da 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 And so something always seems to happen that makes the future feel so risky and so unreliable and so wishful, but not tangible. When we have assets, it allows us to begin to make active purchases into the future, right? So it draws it and makes it feel less risky to us. I have the money or I'm building the money to pay for college. And so it doesn't seem so wishful, so dreamful. Uh, where deep wealth inequality exists, it reflects an economic system that produces different life chances and a correction is required. We had the Homestead Act, we had the GI Bill. I would submit to you, it's time for another cor correction in our society. If the correction is not made, belief in the American dream starts to fade and civil unrest becomes more common. We see evidence of this today. I'll give you a quick story that relates to what I just said. The hardest thing I've found about being poor is feeling like you have no tangible hope. This is not to say that poor people don't have hope. They do, but it is aspirational. For example, my mother and I would walk through affluent neighborhoods and talk of living there one day, but we could see by affluent, I don't mean really rich, but it's better than what we had, uh, living there one day, but we could see no tangible way to make that dream a reality. While this type of hope helps you make it through the day. It doesn't change how you behave. It's hope divorced from a future. So it served this valuable function for us, almost like a daydream that allowed us to continue to move forward. But there was no rational reasons for us to think that we would ever one day get one of those houses. I mean, we were living on the street. We were going, when we lived in the house, we were going across the street to one of those old pumps where you pump water out of the ground to get water to wash ourselves and to wash our clothes. We had no heat, we had no electric. I mean, sometimes living in a house can be as bad as being homeless or worse in some ways because the expectations are different. Um, and so walking through those places and dreaming about one day being there did serve a functional purpose, but it wasn't really tangible hope. Small dollar CSAs, the infrastructure for uh, a wealth revolution. So, so now 
Uh, moving on to kind of the intervention that I propose uh, for making a difference. What are children's savings accounts? They are a vessel for 21st century wealth correction, uh, potentially. CSAs provide, are, are provided through financial instruments, such as 529s or, or regular bank accounts or credit unions, and connect families to financial institutions while providing them with an opportunity to contribute and receive transfers, thus developing the capacity to build new wealth. And so I want to point that out. Sometimes the name can be misleading, and, and, and scholars like Michael Shradden would suggest using like child development accounts as opposed to child savings accounts. Excuse me. I continue with child savings accounts because it's most well known. And I'm not sure that child development accounts quite gets us where we want to go either. But the, the handicap of a child savings accounts is people begin to think that everything's about the saving activity of the family. I would submit to you that saving in and of itself is important for families to learn to save, uh, but it's not going to deliver low income people from poverty. Like poor people aren't going to save enough to get out of poverty, right? But these accounts, A, allow them to save, to participate in their own uh, life transformation, but then they also provide a structure that will allow us to pump other wealth into those accounts. So don't think about them as being just for the individual to save in. That's a part of it, and that's important in some ways. Uh, but it's also about, so for so quick example, when we had the uh, government shutdown, and, they, and the government wanted to provide payments to people, they didn't have any infrastructure in place for a lot of people, particularly low-income people, to even pump money to them. Everybody have an account on a very basic way of looking at it, provide you that infrastructure to easily transfer money to families. We even saw that with the COVID payments, right? And so uh, these structures are important. And then you have a wealth building structure that allows them, it's an, it's an investment account. And so they put money in and that grows over time. And particularly when we can start putting other money in, which we'll talk about in a minute. So, so the accounts matter in, in and one of the things we lost track of when we when we started thinking about college debt was how we pay for college matters, right? And, and, and so providing the right structure for paying for the accounts will have an impact on this uh, effects. Uh, I should mention quickly, by the end of 2020, there were 109 CSA programs serving 922,000 families, children in more than 36 states. There's a number of statewide programs now, Pennsylvania, Nebraska, Maine, uh, Colorado and others. Uh, and so this idea has caught on. When we talk about these, we're talking about small dollar accounts. They usually have anywhere from initial deposit of $5 to $1,000, uh, but relatively small amounts of money. Okay, what makes uh, CSAs the ideal vehicle for a, a wealth transfer to me is because their potential for asset effects. I gotta watch my time here. Um, I have until six, so I, so I think I'm in good shape. Um, so they produce what we call asset effects. And this really wasn't a theoretical idea Michael Sheridan had back in the 1990s when he talked about asset effects. And, and we've been about going to research to see whether these effects actually exist. So what makes CSAs the ideal vehicle for a wealth transfer? Isn't their ability to help children pay for college necessarily, I should say. It's their ability to complement efforts to reduce inequality in early education, facilitate college completion, and improve post-college financial health. Uh, CSAs equip children with the skills associated with a strong start in life. An experimental test of CSAs finds infants who were randomly assigned to receive CSAs demonstrated significantly higher social emotional skills at age four than their counterparts without a CSA. The effects were even stronger than Head Start. These effects are strongest, and this is consistent throughout the research on CSAs among low-income families. So they affect the families we want to affect the most. CSAs give parents new hope for their children's futures and may change how they interact. Children with improved social emotional skills display attitudes and behavior that position them for academic achievement. Uh, uh, CSAs help uh, children get in, to and through college. Every year, many minority and low-income students fail to transition to college despite having the desire and ability to go. 
CSAs are associated with reducing will by cultivating a college saver identity. When students expect to go to college and have identified savings as a strategy to pay for it, they have a tangible plan to overcome the inevitable obstacles they encounter and they're more likely to make it. Uh, CSAs help students realize the payoff of college promise. Evidence suggests that CSAs may be a gateway not only to higher earnings as a college graduate, but also to a more diversified asset portfolio and more wealth accumulation. So they have stocks, bonds, other types of assets. This wealth accumulation is one of the outcomes that ultimately motivates most Americans to pursue college degrees. It is in this post-college period that CSAs most differentiate themselves from other forms of financial aid like college debt. A child who knows all her life that uh, she has money in the bank for college stands in stark contrast to an indebted recent college graduate. And so these are just a few of the findings, but in, in, in the randomized control trial also finds that uh, families, uh, parents of children with CSAs uh, have a higher expectations to go to college. They find that it reduces per, uh, uh, parental uh, maternal depression, should I say, maternal depression. They find that it, it uh, improves parental practices, so they're less likely to uh, beat their kids, for example. Uh, and, and most of this we find works through this increased hope kids, uh, parents have for their kids' futures and kids have for their own futures, right? And so because they, even with regard to like social emotional development among kids, that it works through parental expectations, right? So, so it reduces 50% of material hardship on kids' social emotional development. So material hardship negatively impacts kids' social emotional development and it reduces that hardship by 50%. Now that's interesting because it's not because there's lots of money in these accounts, right? In this case, we're talking about small dollar CSAs. So it's really about providing these families with this tangible hope for their futures, giving them a strategy so they can begin saving on their own. And so other people can put money in those accounts is how this uh, mechanism works, we think, and, and have evidence to suggest that. Small dollar CSAs, um, the start of a revolution, but not the end game. Um, so today's growing economic inequality means that small dollar CSAs, I initial deposits of $25 to 1,000, really $5 to 1,000, are not enough to end wealth inequality or an unequal return on a degree. Low income families have little discretionary money, as we all know, and will never be able to save enough to make up for their from behind start in life. These children compete on an uneven playing field against peers with entrenched generational wealth advantages. These wealth advantages are only magnified during periods of economic instability, uh, which are becoming more frequent, like the Great Recession, government shutdown, now COVID-19, and, and many other things along the way. So, so even though I'm a CSA researcher, I can tell you that small dollar CSAs are insufficient. And I think that's important as a researcher to be honest and open about what you see. Inequality cannot be reduced by giving everyone the same amount. Progressiv progressivity necessary, is necessary for reducing wealth inequality. For example, the Institute on Assets and Social Policy find that a universal progressive children's asset building intervention with an initial deposit of $7,500 for low wealth households and incremental declines to $1,250, which means the poorest kids get $7,500 wealth kids and the, and the highest wealth kids get $1,250, reduces the black white wealth gap by 23% and the Latino uh, white wealth gap by 28%. So if we are to tackle wealth inequality, and I know so somewhere like Maine, for example, has a statewide CSA program to give every kid $500. Now we do see, and I've done research, I've done a paper on it, that it does reduce wealth inequality, even give everybody the same amount, but for a short period of time. Because in the end of the day, the low, the high income families can put more money into their accounts than low income families. And so if we are to tackle wealth inequality at all, but particularly within a CSA, there has to be progressivity in the amount of money we put in the accounts. 
low income people who have less wealth to start from, if we're going to reduce wealth inequality, have to have more money put into their account initially. Shouldn't be rocket science to us, um, but it's something that we argue and debate about. So we're almost winding down here. We're in good shape, I think. So policies to move from small dollar CSAs to a wealth revolution in America. There's some policies that are, are, are being mentioned. While saving is important within CSA programs, it is not the only tool at the disposal for building assets. By providing every child with an account, as several states have done, the scaffolding is put in place to augment the saving efforts of low-income families through targeted ongoing deposits. Maybe the best example of a proposal for targeted ongoing deposits is Senator Booker's American Opportunities Act, or baby bonds. This legislation would provide every newborn child with a baby bond saving account in an initial $1,000 deposit. For children, uh, poor children would receive an additional $2,000 annually until age 18. Up, um, upon turning 18, the child could access the funds up to $46,000 if low income, uh, for, if low income for wealth building purposes. Another proposal for ongoing deposit was made by the College Board. Uh, they recommend putting a portion of the Pell Grant funds into savings accounts for children starting as early as age 11 and 12. One of the advantages to this idea, and I think this is an extremely important idea, is that um, it's money we're already allocating. And so it's just reallocating it to these savings accounts and putting a portion of it into the accounts early on so kids grow up with wealth. It matters when you grow up with wealth. Uh, similarly, nonprofit scholarships providers are beginning to use some of the scholarship funds as early awards placed in accounts. For example, the Community Foundation of Wabash County was approached by a donor who wanted to provide funding for a traditional scholarship. However, after consultation, uh, the donor opted to award eligible students with a $1,000 scholarship to be placed in their CSA in grades uh, 4 through 18 uh, in the Wabash uh, City Schools Opportunity Award program was born. This change in thinking, this idea of thinking about scholarships as early awards, which is different than early um, commitment programs where we, we say, here's a promise of money in the future, but actually putting that money into the accounts uh, early on. Uh, places like Kauffman Foundation are, are doing similar things at, at a much larger tune. And so this is one of the narratives that I think we need to think about uh, in our society uh, in, in about scholarships. So I'll end here so we can have a good, uh, vibrant uh, conversation with this statement. And, and what would, what would uh, this conversation be without a, a, a call to social workers? When is the last time we as a profession were unified enough to call for, no demand of our politicians, a wealth building program as grand as the Homestead Act or the GI Bill? It might be about time, it might be worth the fight. What foundation, what state, what nation will be the first to transform their scholarship programs into asset building programs? Changing our national culture so that we think about financing college when children are born, not when they graduate, will not be simple. However, this does not seem as daunting as flying to the moon must have seemed to people in 1961. We must be willing to free our minds so that we can dare to make a better future for our children, one that links futures to the present to policies that not only provide enough to live by, but something to live for. And so I'll end there and uh, return it to, to Ron, I think. Great. Um, thank you very much for just a very stimulating um, talk. Uh, we've received uh, several uh, questions and I, I'm trying to uh, pick and choose among them. So first, uh, could you, could you, uh, you know, really address the question about how uh, CSAs can uh, reduce the wealth gap and strengthen the return on degrees that, that uh, uh, on, on a college degree in the first instance? Yes, um, and I, so, so part of it is, is the research that I've shown is that um, if someone graduated with college debt or, or just no debt, uh, they're gonna have a less wealth and, 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 and so have a less return on a degree. 
And so uh, there's been research showing that uh, the people who call who graduate with a college degree, and, and compared to people who who are in debt and not in debt, that they have less wealth. And so what CSAs do is provide a vehicle for us to put wealth into these accounts. So when they go to college, they go to college having assets. Not only do they go to college, and I think this is a shortcoming in CSAs right now, right? Is that because they've been largely attached to the 529 program as an implementation thing, it's been narrowed to education, first of all. And secondly, uh, you can't carry money after you're done, right? In a, in a real good program, uh, an infrastructure, and, and Senator Casey uh, has proposed in his five freedoms, not using 529 for some of these reasons and using a different structure because that will allow you then to use it not only for education, but for entrepreneurship, starting a home, other assets. But then it will also allow you once you, if your education is financed in some other way, carry that money forward to start your life with. So if we just basically, I'll, I'll stop here. I don't want to answer too long. If we understand first, in the first instance, that in, in this, my story with Melinda's story, I think helps paint that picture. Even me getting a PhD and her getting MSW, she ended up with far more wealth at, this, at a similar age because she started off with that wealth. We went to the same college, the same university, the same program, and yet her wealth standing was so much better because her parents paid for education, let her go to uh, Spain and study a language, take a, a job that was a public, uh, public job at first was a lower paying job, helped pay for her husband's master's degree. You know, all these things happened so that uh, her degree, she could leverage much better than I could with my degree, starting off in debt, helping help my parents out and all the other things. So um, uh, you've touched on, on another question. So you've made a, a distinction between um, the, the small accounts that many of the uh, interventions that you're working with have used and the need for uh, uh, the CSAs with, with, with larger accounts. Someone asked the question, um, how would having a CSA affect eligibility for financial aid? Because you, you don't expect these systems to disappear the one system to disappear and immediately replace the other. And so uh, do this, are the small accounts um, yielding enough uh, uh, assets so that the, the people involved in these uh, interventions are able to afford college with no debt? So no, not okay. small, a small or CSA is not gonna give you enough money to enter in, in, in. And, and to totally pay for college, if, if I heard you right, right, it's not going to give you forty, more than forty thousand dollars a year, right, uh, for some 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 education, right? Some schools are, are that cost with everything. So, so two things. One is, a we have to free our minds some. And what I mean by that is, the restrictions on asset limits are a policy decision, and thus can be changed. And, and, and in fact under Obama were changed and expanded. So you can have, I think, and don't quote me on this, up to $40,000 in assets before you start getting penalized. And so none of these current CSA programs reach that level of assets. Uh, but if it was changed once, it could be expanded. Now, there's other issues related to that beyond financial, financial aid concerns. There's also welfare concerns. So let me address that too. So benefit concerns. So having assets, uh, there are um, restrictions, income restrictions and wealth restrictions on receiving public benefits. And so the fear becomes is if you're in one of these programs, would it prevent you from getting public assistance? That's right. Now, there's been activity on that. And that's, that's also a policy issue. Somewhere like Illinois has, in Hawaii have dropped asset limits from public benefits. So these things can be done. Other places have expanded the amounts that you can have so that they don't affect it. Uh, some people have marked out CSAs in particular from being affected by this legislation. So, so there's ways of addressing this. Uh, it is an issue and one that hasn't been fully addressed, uh, but there's certainly policy ways of addressing it. And we see examples of that. 
in a number of states and different places. So um, in your talk you, and the book, uh, and which I highly uh, recommend to, uh, to our audience, um, you talk a lot about um, not only changing sort of individual uh, expectations about college attendance, but you talk about the role of institutions, that there need to be institutional support to, to buttress the, the differential decisions that people are making once they have access to these accounts. Can you uh, just uh, delineate how the potential role of financial institutions as we understand them today to facilitate the kind of uh, supports you're talking about? I'm not 100% I fully understood the question. Um, so I'm gonna let you rephrase it one time. So, so again, uh, if we think about financial institutions, um, which sometimes participate in, um, in child savings accounts okay. that, are, that may not necessarily be targeted at education, uh, how can we change, uh, what is their role in this larger agenda? Sorry. That, no, I understand it now. Um, I wasn't sure what institution you were, were speaking about. So, so yeah, and, and I should have linked to you. I mean, I'm part of some expert group. And so maybe afterwards, I'll send a document uh, that you can share with, with, with the people who participated because they did a, a document talking about, in particular, 529, because they're, they're the biggest kind of provider, of, particularly of state CSA programs, right? Uh, some of the local programs use banks and credit unions, but, but the larger uh, statewide programs would use 529. And so how do we reform those institutions so that they better serve um, CSAs, right? In, in, the, in, in, in the families we're trying to serve. What, one thing is, 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 is just this restricted use of it, right? And so it's, if it's a 529, it's, it's by federal legislation restricted to education. Uh, and we understand that not everybody's going to go to a four-year college, nor should anybody, right? I mean, I say nor because some people want to start a business or do whatever else. They can do other things in life. And so having flexibility there. Now, I think, again, we see where this is a policy so it can be changed. And we've seen some example of that in recently in federal legislation where they have allowed the 529 money to be spent on uh, early education expenses for going to a different school. Like now, now you can now use your 5 to money, 29 money, not only for paying for college, but paying for going to a private private school while you're in elementary school or whatever else, right? So it tells you that there's flexibility and these things can be changed. And so, and then there's also things like Senator Casey, who's advocating for a totally different system than 529 being, read, uh, being run by Treasury and developed by Treasury a separate new financial tool that can be used that won't have these restrictions on use and these other kind of things. So, so these are these are again just policy things that have already been shown that can be changed and that we can change. I, I would say one other, one other quick thing about five two nines in particular uh, or or banks and credit unions is right now. At best, we have state models. We don't have a national model. And so uh, there's competition amongst the different providers and, 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 and they don't have a large incentive to provide accounts to poor people, right? It's lost, less cost effective to them to provide accounts to poor people than it is to rich people because rich people have more money in the accounts. So you know the transactions are more costly. That's overcome to a degree at the state level because uh, you have a wider number of people in the pool, so you can overcome the smaller balances by by the low income people. And so a national model would even farther do that. And then I think if you start putting real money in the accounts, in addition, well, those people won't care as much. If you start putting baby bond type of money into a CSA they will fight uh, tooth and nail for the right to deliver those accounts to everybody. So um, one of the things I uh, appreciated about reading the, the, the book is, um, you know, you have a really big vision. And, uh, but it reminded me, uh, as I was reading, of um, sort of uh, a statement that's in uh, one of our colleagues' books, uh, Irv Garfinkel, who talks about the welfare state, about the very modest role that the federal government plays generally in education funding. 
And so you, you celebrate the many state uh, examples that you are working on and kind of bemoan the lack of federal participation in your big vision. Does that require reversing as well so that the, the federal government has a bigger footprint in this? Talk to me about that. For sure. So, and, and we have, again, history on our side. So I would argue, and I talked about that slightly in my, my slides in this way. We had the Homestead Act. We had the GI Bill. Like, there have been times when wealth inequality has grown greatly, that there's been large investments by the federal government to the people. And, and I think we see that to a small degree in the infrastructure bill. There's an appetite and an acknowledgement that there's a need for greater investment by the federal government. Now, it also means that that call at the end of my slides is of absolute importance. The federal government is not going to reinvest money if we don't push and holler for it. I'll give one more quick example. I used to work with the Native uh, Congress of American Indians. And, and a lot of times the conversation would come up about giving back the land. And, and I would, and I didn't have a house at the time. I didn't own a house at the time. But I would think about that. Like if I did own a house and I lived there all my life, or was I that privileged? Would I want to give up my house without a fight? Probably not. And my point is, is that the wealthy are not going to give us a wealth transfer without a fight. And so if we don't rally together, understand that income is not enough to solve poverty and that a wealth transfer is also needed, it's not going to happen. None of this is going to happen without a bit of a push because people are people. So um, as, as, a, as a leading expert who's been involved in many uh, different interventions, can you uh, just think about What's the, what is the best model you think that's out there that, that's working on uh, these CSAs in terms of uh, either effects for younger children or persistence? I, I would probably point to St. Paul, Minneapolis, uh, because not because they made it to the baby bond stage where they're putting large dollars in there, but they have combined things like guaranteed income with their CSA program. And so for me, the biggest felling among poverty researchers is we're in this mindset of income first, give them enough to live by, but not something to live for. And so I wanna explain more the model. So not only have they done guaranteed income and, and they've done it on a small scale, the part of the mayor's uh, research study that's across, I don't know how many states and, and, and what they did, the mayor there at, in St. Paul did, was he attached it to uh, people participating in the CSA program. So to participate in the guaranteed income, you had to be a member in the CSA program, which is great, interesting. Uh, then they also have done things and are thinking about things like, how do we put additional money beyond what people are saving in their accounts, in those accounts? And so they've begun to really work at getting local communities, uh, local employers, companies to think about putting money into these kids' accounts. Uh, mm -hmm. They are also doing things around and thinking about how do we connect financial literacy, for example, to mm -hmm. the CSA program. That's what I love about CSA programs, and that's how I differentiate them from baby bond. It's not just the money, right? We want to connect guaranteed income to the CSA program. We want to connect... Um, uh, financial literacy. So look, when you're in a classroom, you can talk about your CSA because everybody in the classroom has a CSA, right? You can tailor math uh, lessons around, and, and then you have experiential learning, right? One thing we know about financial literacy, some people will say, do a financial literacy if you get the money. But financial literacy doesn't have long-term effects on kids because it doesn't apply to their lives, right? It's not applying your life. So experiential learning is you give them the financial literacy, then you give them an account and eventually you throw some money in that account. Now they got real reason to pay attention to it. It's something that changes things in their lives. And that's the full fuller model that I'm looking for in the end. And I, and I would say is New York has a program, the city of New York, not all of everybody's aware of that, that the, the, the mayor just passed a program 
and it has some of these elements. Even though they're putting, it's a small dollar CSA, uh, they are actively, constructively looking at getting employers and other people to put money in those accounts for communities to adopt kids in their community and put money in those accounts, right? They're, they're thinking about things like that. And that's what makes CSA powerful because it's not just a federal investment then. Like we need a federal or city investment, but then we need to be able to bring other groups into this and have a more holistic approach to building up those assets to really tackle wealth and equality in a meaningful way that no one legislation will do on its own. So um, I, I think I'm being uh, prompted to, to, to wrap this up, but let me let, let me just, just ask one more question if I may. Never wrap it up. <laughs> Sorry. <is> no. <laughs> um, uh, my familiarity with, with uh, asset programs comes from the ones that uh, uh, the uh, Health and Human Services operates, where they're trying to uh, target um, low-income men for the purpose of facilitating their support of children. And what they're finding is uh, whether or not a person has a steady job does radically influence whether they are able to comp contribute to the health to the to the accounts once they're begun. In the in the uh, in the interventions that you're working on, uh, have you found that you can go, you know, that you, you need to require that people have a, a steady employment and the like in order to be able to effectively participate in the program? Well, I saw, this is where I think, you know, a lot of CSA programs fall into this category as well. The logic is messed up from the start. Okay. And, and so, you're taking the savings piece and elevating it in the program to a level that we'll never achieve. So my point is this, even if they have a job, low-income families are not going to save enough to deliver themselves from poverty. So yes, yes, as I say with guaranteed income, it's good to link guaranteed income to CSA programs or things like that. You should link work programs like that. But let's think about this. In a global economy, where we're thinking about this place and truck drivers and everybody else at some point, some people aren't gonna have a job. Assets will become even more and more important. And we could think of providing them with assets even when they don't have a job or a guaranteed income or, or both. So work is vitally important and I'm not suggesting that we don't encourage it, but in the end of the day, we're not saying people are gonna save themselves out of to prosperity. It's a part of it, and it's important that people know how to save and the value of saving and that they feel like they contributed to their own success, right? Even if they put a small amount of money in, you feel differently about things when you've contributed to them, right? And so all those things are very, very valuable. We have research to show that. Uh, but it's wrongheaded to think that the savings is the, the really important thing about these programs. It's not. So um, again, uh, one of the things that, uh, that I focused on as um, I was reading it, and there is a question, you talk much about uh, CSA programs that are targeted at very young children uh, and, and overturning the way the system operates so that you move the point of action from financial aid at the point of college entry to much earlier. But can you talk a little bit about the evidence uh, about the effect of CSAs on persistence in higher education. Because one of the things that we're learning is that the, the gaps between college enrollment, uh, uh, between sort of uh, high wealth families and low wealth families are closing. It's the persistence that's the problem. So can you tell, talk, talk about the, the other end of the age spectrum in terms of what CSAs are doing? Let me say one thing quickly related to that is that there are some programs that start later. So Kauffman Foundation, and it's a Kansas City scholar, that fit exact name of it, sorry. Uh, they start, and it's from, the, it came out of the Kauffman Foundation. They start in uh, eighth grade, sixth or eighth grade. So they start later. Uh, and, 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 and they attach, for some of the kids have the option of not only having a CSA, but to get a $40,000 scholarship to go to college. So this is a long-term strategy. And, and so there is evidence to suggest, A, that there's early metrics that suggest that we can expect it to have a positive effect on uh, long-term outcomes. And I talked about those to some degree, social emotional development, 
poor expectations, all these are good predictors of future academic success. But to get more to your question, uh, we have done, and this is correlational because the problem with some of these programs is many of them, the kids haven't reached college age yet. So you start at birth, you know, you got to travel through a number of years before they reach college age. We do have um, one group of kids who started in the initial um, demonstration of CSAs way, way back in the early uh, 1990s that are now reaching college age, early late 90s. Um, uh, and so we do have some evidence coming, but it hasn't been published yet. And it seems positive. Uh, but then we also have a randomized control trial, I think I talked to you about earlier from Italy, that actually looks at kids who were in high school that then graduated and went to college. And so we found, they found that they were more likely to go to college and that they were persisting and performing better while in college. Mm. Um, I, there's much more research that needs to be done on that. I've done secondary data analysis on this using proxies like kids who have savings accounts. And, and it shows positive effects as well on their persistence in college and as well as their graduation from college. Um, all the evidence, so th this, this, this evidence I feel more confidence in because of the early term metrics that we're seeing and in, 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 in the positive effects among uh, those as well. Hopefully that made some sense, a bit rambling there, sorry. So, uh, you know, as we sort of prepare to wrap up, can, can you, uh, just um, take a deep breath and summarize sort of what are the key points that the American public needs to understand about C CSAs and their potential? What's the big picture uh, lesson that you'd like us to stay with? Is that they provide a way for us to have a wealth transfer that's not only about providing families with money, but that they also work hand in hand with many of the things we know are important, math tutoring, right? So kids who want to go to college, think college is possible for them, are gonna do better in their math classes. And we have evidence of that, and that shouldn't shock us. That it works better with our Head Start programs and in the, in the, in the efforts to create social emotional development around kids, right? So one of the things about our education system is it's very disjointed, our policies in general. So we have early education researchers and we have post-secondary education researchers. And then we have researchers who study after college. CSAs allow us to connect all this research, all these interventions and, and, and carry the kid from birth all the way to the grave, right? All the way to retirement. So to me, that's something that our system lacks and that this can provide. It also provides a way for you and I, for, for um, uh, employers and everybody else to contribute. Once that infrastructure is in place, we can all put money into that thing and contribute to it. And it allows us to build out our financial education, our financial literacy in real ways for these kids. So, so it's that infrastructure that the American system is lacking. It's not a silver bullet, but it ties all these things together and augments all these things in a way that will allow us to function more cohesively. And I think that's tremendously valuable. Thank you. Uh, I, I guess my final question is, can you uh, uh, speak to uh, other countries that, that, that are into the, uh, that are into CSAs and have more development in, in policy than is here in the United States that we might think of as models that need to be replicated in any way. Singapore is probably the gold standard because they have many asset building programs for their families. They have an, an early education enrichment asset building program and that allows them, it's almost like a early savings account, if you will, that allows the families to, that the government puts money into for low income families to be able to take a trip to Spain or do whatever, right? To, to those early enrichment activities that you would do in grade school and elementary school that the kids lose out on. They also have a, a, a savings account program for college, right? So they have money for that. They have, a, they have an asset account for home ownership, for retirement, right? So they, they have the full spectrum. They yeah. have what, rich, what most rich people have, right? Like, like you don't just have a, 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 a short-term savings account or emergency savings account. You also have a intermediate account and a long-term account, right? Even PNC Bank now offers an account structure like that that you can divide your money up. So this is not novel. Uh, Canada would be another good example. 
Uh, and they are doing some more of uh, something closer, but not quite to the level we're talking about, a baby bond. They put more money into the accounts for families. They also have something interesting that I don't know will fly in America, uh, but because they, um, so when you open up your CSA, um, oftentimes there's an expected amount of money you have to save every month in it, right? So they actually, that's part of it. And, and they can do that because they have a child trust fund. So okay. families get $100 in there every every month. It's more than that now. At least you get $100 every month. And, and, and so there's they have money. And, it, and the research shows they put that money into the account, right? So you can put a $50 stipulation on it because then the family's dumping that in there. Um, and, and, and really in the initial, and I'll shut up, is the initial vision of Sheradden was, and, and I think where he doesn't sometimes recognize and, and, and totally focus in on is that we don't have institutional savings, right? Even in the CSA, institutional savings means like money's automatically being taken out of your account and being put into saving. You no longer have to do anything. And that's how people save. Mm -hmm. But because we, even though we open an account for everybody, we can't automatically draw it out of their account and put money, right? Like, but, but that would be the real vision someday of that kind of thing happening and, and, and through some kind of government transfer, right? Where that money's automatically being put in to their account for them, that would be saving in a real institutional kind of way. And that's well, the way we right. can Well, uh, listen, I, I really enjoyed uh, very much reading the book, having an opportunity to exchange with you, and I'm sure our audience did as well. Uh, you, you have a, a big vision around this, but you're also into the weeds. Uh, and I really appreciate the opportunity to, to talk with you. And I'm going to turn it back over to Dean Begg. Thank you very much. Thank you. I echo that, Ron. That was a truly compelling and thought-provoking presentation. Thank you, Dr. Elliott, for sharing your work with us. Um, and thanks to Dr. Mincy for your usual incisive moderating. I, I think we all knew, sadly, that the American dream is not accessible to all, but uh, your work to delineate exactly how and how this works through and how to fix it um, is incredibly motivating. So um, thank you for that. And I'm sure that many in, in the audience today will be getting involved in the asset revolution. I, I think that's, that's our hope um, based on your scholarship and based on your attention to translating that scholarship into policy. So thank you, Dr. Elliott from all of us and thanks everyone for joining us. I got a quick, quick thank you. To Please. And, and I wanna say that like, and I'm not, I don't just say things, um, that I really enjoyed the intellectual conversation with all the faculty along the way. And, and I'm so grateful that so many people decided to turn out. And, and I really do hope that you'll take this challenge and, and innovate on it and, and really do something with it. Wonderful. Uh, that's perfect. And thank you again.